catch up. Um, my name is Raghavan Srinivas. I go by Rags. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free to follow me at uh, Rags S. My goal is to have at least two people follow me, you know, after I finish speaking at a conference. Hope, hope I can hit that goal. Um, so what I'm here to talk about is basically about OpenStack and kind of an evolving landscape. And, uh, you know, um, I work as a solutions architect at Rackspace, uh, but I really come more from an application background. Um, and, and somehow there is this misnomer that if you have a infrastructure as a service, you know, your application is going to automatically scale. Uh, and that's not really true. You know, um, for those of you who have an application background, right, you know that, you know, your application has to kind of adapt to the infrastructure, your infrastructure has to kind of work with the application and so on. So, so the goal of this talk is not primarily to talk about OpenStack. You know, I'll definitely talk about OpenStack. I will talk about, um, you know, um, about what, what, are, what is OpenStack, why OpenStack, and so on, and why would you want to have your apps on OpenStack. Um, but, but really the goal here is to talk about, you know, kind of this evolving uh, application landscape, as I call it, and, and kind of the notion of amorphous clouds, and I'll talk about all that in a, in a, in a bit. Uh, before I get started, how many of you had never heard of OpenStack before you came to this conference? You know, never heard of it. Okay, cool. That's good. So I don't need to talk too much about OpenStack. So what I'll do is, you know, kind of quickly go through it. I have a couple of demos. You know, they've been kind of iffy, depending on the time of the day. You know, it's been working and it's not. But, uh, you know, that's typical how demos work, right? So those are real demos. You know, they're working on my laptop. Um, there is one that, you know, basically accesses a public cloud. Uh, there is another which accesses the private cloud. So, so you know, it's not going to be all kill by PowerPoint, death by PowerPoint, whatever. Um, so I will do a couple of demos, but, but again, you know, if those, those don't work, I will come back to death by PowerPoint. And, okay. um, I work as an architect and evangelist. I've uh, worked on several different technologies. Um, but, um, you know, kind of working in the infrastructure side is a little bit new to me. Uh, but like I said, I think, I think, you know, my goal is to kind of take my application skills and see how I can, you know, use that, uh, you know, to kind of evangelize OpenStack in general and Rackspace Private Cloud, you know, which is where um, I work, and, and talk about how it is going to be interesting to developers, okay? Uh, how many of you have, um, you know, already deployed on OpenStack, so to say? A few. Okay, that's good. Uh, how many of you would call yourself as kind of developers versus system administrators? You know, I mean, I think it's, you know, the line is thinning. But if you have written like 1,000 lines of code in Java or Python or Ruby or whatever your favorite language is as opposed to Bash, right? So, so would you call yourself more of a developer? How many developers? Okay. How many of you would be system administrators who are never going to write any, you know, <laughs> touch Java or anything? Okay, that's cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to definitely underemphasize JClouds. You know, JClouds is the Java API for accessing, um, you know, uh, any, any cloud, really. You know, it could be a public cloud, a private cloud. It could be uh, Rackspace. It could be HP. It could be Red Hat, really anything, right? Uh, but, but really, it's one of the different APIs. You know, we have Ruby APIs. We have Python APIs as well for accessing the cloud. Uh, but, but what I'm going to talk about is, you know, is generally about application design and how OpenStack could help you uh, in kind of, uh, you know, building your application, so to say. So here's my agenda, you know, pretty straightforward. I'm going to talk about scalability. Um, you know, I think, I think the, the goal of this session are, are really, you know, most of the sessions here is really about scale out, okay? Uh, we'll talk about, you know, tenets or pillars of a cloudy application, right? Uh, we will look at how OpenStack is going to help. Um, look briefly at JClouds, uh, and, and somewhere in between I'm going to do a few demos, okay? And then we'll do a resources, call for action, and summary. Seem okay? Yeah? All right. Um, so the changing application landscape, right? I wrote my application, right? And, you know, some celebrity tweeted, and I have a problem now. You know, everybody is accessing the application, you know, where I expected about hundreds of thousands of users, now I'm getting hundreds of millions of users. You know, how do I, you know, I have a problem, right? So how do I, how do I deal with this? 
the easiest way to do it, to deal with this is you know scale up right get a bigger box pay more money to oracle right uh, and and be done with it. Ho hopefully nobody from oracle here right um, okay so um, you know application scales out just add more servers uh, and you're pretty much all set right uh, but the problem with this approach is that you know as the database scales up okay you really can't go beyond a certain point okay you get to a point where you hit the wall right um, you cannot keep scaling up and up and up okay and also there is a, a, a another fundamental problem here is that you essentially will have to you know throw away your existing servers right you know sometimes you just cannot keep going up on the existing box right you may have to get a new box right uh, in which case it's not you know um, the ideal way to do things um, so another way of looking at the same thing is you know here's my infrastructure right and here's my application right um, so the easiest way you know to to get more horsepower and no pun intended here is to get a bigger horse right you know very very simple you know very easy to do that uh, you know of course you can you can also make the jockey a little bit thinner right you know if I was sitting on the hearts you know uh, it's not gonna help so you can get a you know a lighter jockey you can make an application a little bit more lightweight and all that right uh, but but you know again there is a limit the point is that you know the point that this particular slide is trying to convey is that your infrastructure and application is kind of hand in hand okay um, I don't know if some of you have seen this movie, um, Avatar. You know, remember this this character? Remember, you know, know the name Bunchy, right? Is that correct? Um, basically, the the application and the infrastructure was fused, right? Or in this case, the animal and the rider were fused in, right? Um, it would be great if we had a bunchy, but unfortunately, you know, there are not too many bunchies in the world, right? So what you really want to do is you, you can have a hardware built for the worst case, but instead, what you can do is you can start off with a baseline capacity, right? And really what you do is instead of scaling up, you scale out, okay? So instead of vertical scaling, you do horizontal scaling, which is, which is kind of fundamental, you know, um, these are things that are pretty obvious right uh, but from an application perspective this is still somewhat somewhat new okay so how do you how do you kind of deal with you know unexpected loads or peak loads or you know loads that are fluctuating through the day or through the year or through the week um, you know essentially what you do is you start with a baseline capacity or routine capacity and then if you want to quickly respond to unan unanticipated events you know something that you don't quite expect um, you know then what you do is you just add more bunches there and you're ready to go right so that's the idea behind um, horizontal scaling so once you accept the fact you know that horizontal scaling is really the way to go with your applications um, you know things become a lot simpler okay I'm sure there are other ways of doing it or maybe there is another way of doing it but I really don't know of any other way you know to be able to scale other than to use commodity servers, right, and being able to scale horizontally, you know, scaling up has its limitations. You know, that's really the bottom line of this particular um, slide. So it's very easy to scale, you know, your database, I mean, your web tier. Your web tier is, you know, throw a lot of, you know, a few more servers, put in a load balancer in front, and you have pretty much scaled your web tier, right? You know, very straightforward to do that. But it's not the same with, with um, you know, with the data tier, right? So it's, you know, when, you, when it comes to the data tier, now you have to all of, all of a sudden kind of deal with it differently. You know, just putting more servers is not going to help you, right? Uh, because your application also has to kind of adapt to that, right? So basically, you want to be able to shard your application, you know, shard your application key or so on, right? So in other words, you know, you want so many of these um, you know, data to be handled by this server, this data to be handled by this server, this data to be handled by this server, and so on, right? The moment you start sharding, now we get into issues, right? Um, you know, how do I deal with what happens if one of these fails? You know, what happens, you know, how do I replicate my key? Uh, how do I keep, 
you know, data consistent? You know, how do I keep my data, um, you know, resilient and so on? So those are the kind of things that you're going to talk about here. But essentially, the idea behind scaling is to be able to, you know, take this curve, right? You know, this is, you know, one of them is system cost. The other is the application response time, right? You know, which is really growing exponentially to somehow try to flatten it as much as possible. You know, that's really the goal of horizontal scaling, right? So once you have achieved horizontal scaling, you know, once you accept horizontal scaling, you know, of course, there are a number of other challenges you have to deal with, okay? But, but that's kind of the fundamental thing that you have to embrace, you know, before you can, you can think of um, kind of scaling your application, okay? So let's say I've accepted horizontal scaling, right? But there are a number of other things that I really want to think about. Um, horizontal scaling, you know, perfect. But I want to be able to kind of auto scale, okay? These are all new features in OpenStack, okay? It's part of the Heat project. You know, Heat is really being able to deploy um, instances, like if you want a Cassandra instance, you want a Hadoop instance, uh, you know, you want a Couchbase instance, you can do that very easily. Um, and to be able to do that, um, you know, b based on certain triggers. You know, the trigger could be like, you know, how many number of users are there. It could be based on response time. It could be based on um, how many messages are in, in the queue. Uh, anything like that, right? And automatically the application scales, you know, in such a way that it's able to handle that load, okay? So auto scaling is one of those features. Design for failure, as somebody says, right? You know, if you design for failure, there is not going to be any failure, right? It's just kind of a cool thing, right? Rather than, you know, trying to prevent it, you know, just accept it and, and, and design for failure, okay? So I cannot, you know, overemphasize the fact that, you know, you want to keep it simple, keep it simple, stupid, right? Uh, Yagni, dry, and so on, you have heard of all this. Nothing new, it's all, you know, again, about extreme programming. But in the case of a, a uh, distributed application, right, which touches a number of different technologies, infrastructure, and so on, this is absolutely important, okay? Uh, as far as possible, use stateless services, okay? Stateless is great. You know, in fact, in OpenStack, a lot of the services are stateless. Doesn't mean that there are no stateful services at all, okay? For instance, MySQL, okay, and we'll see that in a second, okay? is a stateful service, okay? RabbitMQ, which is really the fundamental, uh, you know, that's what's used for messaging, is also stateful. Um, there are ways of dealing with stateless and stateful, but if you can, you know, try to stick to stateless, okay? Uh, exploit parallelism. Just because there are multiple servers, okay, um, and if you're not really exploiting it, you know, it's not going to help you. Um, you know, yes, it may be good for redundancy, it may be good for failover, uh, and so on. But at the same time, you know, if you can, if you can use those different machines or those different servers or those different compute nodes available for you um, and, and use them well, um, you know, I think that's good. That's, that's how we are exploiting parallelism. And, and there are a number of infrastructure, you know, that's kind of where I'm getting to, uh, which, which kind of automatically do this. You don't have to do a whole lot you know, to make it happen. So, so what you can do is, you know, kind of use that infrastructure uh, and, and kind of deploy it on top of OpenStack, okay? So hopefully I'm making the connection between this new generation applications and OpenStack, okay? Uh, minimize data movement is extremely important, you know, especially if you're looking at terabytes or petabytes of data, you know, you can't get away with no ETL. You know, ETL stands for extract, transform, and load, right? Uh, you can do, you know, ETL is good, but you want to minimize it as much as possible, right? One of the cool things about Hadoop, you know, which is the Hadoop distributed file system, is that it does not move the data to where the compute is. It moves the compute to where the data is. You know, that's kind of a cool thing, right, if you think about it. Because if you have, like, hundreds of nodes, you know, you don't want to move the data from each of those nodes you know, to the compute because it's just a bottleneck. It's a huge bottleneck. So what it does instead is you have this MapReduce code which essentially runs on each of these different, you know, nodes, okay, or each of these different splits and so on, okay? Uh, keep data closer to the end user. 
you know, this is again, if it's static data, uh, which does not need to be processed, you know, it's better to keep it closer to the end user, where it's going to be consumed. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical user. It could be a web service. It could be anything, right? Uh, it could even be an analytics engine. As far as possible, keep it closer to the end user. The idea is to, again, minimize the data movement, okay? And one of the key things that I think is very critical, um, you know, is minimize barriers for exit, okay? So in other words, you know, if I have my application which is built on OpenStack with, you know, let, let's say Rackspace Private Cloud, and for some reason you decide, well, you know, Rackspace Private Cloud is just not working for me, right? You know, you can move to HP Cloud, you know, with, with relative ease, right? You know, I'm not going to say it's, it's just magically happened, but, but you know, um, it, it's, it's relatively straightforward, okay? There are a bunch of other requirements, okay, and I know that, you know, you're designing applications, and I really don't want to talk about all of those, but, but you know, real-time access could be a bit, big thing, right? You know, if I'm doing everything on Hadoop, you know, Hadoop is really great for batch time processing, right? Um, but, but not ideal if I'm using it as an operational store. In other words, if I want something right now, um, you know, it's probably not a data store that you'll use. You know, of course, there are some new initiatives happening in the Hadoop world, okay? that make it happen, uh, but, but you want to think about real-time access, ability to connect to other data stores, you know, like, like analytics engines, you know, could be Informatica, could be, you know, whatever that is, right? Um, ability for business or non-technical users to visualize the data, right? So, you know, uh, one of your user calls you up and says, well, I want to be able to visualize this data this way. You know, you're going to say, well, you know, well, I'll write the, you know, MapReduce code and get back to you in a couple of days. That's probably not a good answer, right? Uh, you want to be able to, you know, for them to write some queries, you know, whether it's Pig, Hive, or whatever um, scripting language uh, that may be invoked. So some of the standard techniques, you know, that are used in, you know, when, whenever you do a scale out is kind of the sharding. Um, distributing data over multiple nodes. Okay, it seems very straightforward, right? I want to distribute data over multiple nodes. Um, replication. We assume that data failure is inherent, right? One of the nodes is possibly going to die. Okay, there's a good chance it will, right? So how do I deal with this? So obviously, if I put it in, you know, the idea behind any kind of availability is that you really want to avoid any kind of single point of failure, right? So if you just have it on one node, you're in trouble already, right? So what you want to do is you want to be able to rep replicate this on multiple nodes. It could be one copy, it could be two copies, it could be three copy. Or it could be 400 copies, depending on how paranoid you are. You know, typically, you know, one or two are, is, is good enough, okay? Um, so resiliency is achieved via replication. Data resiliency is achieved via replication. But the moment, you know, you get into it, you get into all kinds of challenges, and we'll talk about all that in a second, okay? So one of the great techniques, you know, this was this... Uh, came, um, this was introduced by uh, Google, uh, you know, basically it's the map reduce technique, okay, and the idea behind the map reduce te technique is very straightforward. You have a set of mappers and you have a set of reducers, okay? So you take the problem and essentially kind of break it down into a set of maps which kind of looks like this, okay? So essentially I have an input which says Hadoop uses map reduce, there is a map phase, there is a reduce phase, dot, 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 right? So each of these different nodes, each of these different mappers essentially gets a portion of the problem, okay? And essentially what it does is it produces some kind of a sort shuffle which looks like this. You know, it looks at Hadoop and says one, right? Map reduce one. So it looks at the document that it is given and breaks it up into a map that essentially the reducer uses to combine those map and produce an output something like this, okay? So there, A, the count is two. Okay, I'm doing a simple word count. Okay, Hadoop, two. E is two. Map one, map reduce one, and so on and so forth. Okay? So map reduce is a great technique where essentially, you know, you, you kind of um, write a, a, you know, a map reduce program which essentially takes the input and, and kind of distributes it on different nodes, right? And, and solves the problem for you. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, uh, it's, it's again not something new, but, but you know, has been used very, 
uh, successfully, not just in Hadoop, but, but actually in a number of other you know, distributor systems. Um, message queues, you know, one of the things that you might have heard when you're designing systems is, you know, loose coupling, loose coupling, loose coupling, right? You really don't want to kind of tie two systems together. I think the easiest way to doing loose coupling is by, you know, using messages and queues, right? You know, it's very straightforward. You know, you send something, and whoever is interested in looking at that will subscribe to that particular topic or queue or whatever, okay, and then, you know, take messages off it and, and process it, okay? In fact, there is uh, a project called Project uh, Marconi. Anybody heard of Project Marconi? Okay. It's, it's an open stack. It's going to be, uh, it's actually an incubated project in uh, open stack, okay, and is going to be part of Project Havana, uh, you know, which is going to be the next release of, uh, of open stack. So the idea, you know, hopefully I'm trying to convey is that, you know, open stack is becoming more and more developer friendly, which is really what, you know, open stack should be. You know, the next wave of development should be driven by the developers, you know, and hopefully all of us can contribute to that. So you might have heard of this as well, the uh, cap theorem. Whenever you have a distributed system, right, uh, this cap theorem kind of comes into the picture. It's also referred to as Brewer's conjecture. Um, you know, Brewer was the one who stated this, and essentially, if you have three things, which is consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, right, you can have only two things at the same time, you know, if you think of three things. So between cap, between C, A, and P, you can either have C and A, or C and P, or A and P, okay? And really, it's up to you to pick uh, which one you want. Most of the new, like, NoSQL databases and, and, and distributed systems that you're seeing today, you know, there is a rapid proliferation, and you will see a, uh, a chart of that in a, in a second, um, you know, basically have partition tolerance. So if you have more than one node, you know, that means it, it has to be partition tolerant, you know, to put it very simply, okay? So now you have to pick whether it's going to be consistent or it's got to be available, okay? And then you get into degrees of consistency, like eventual consistency and so on. Um, and then availability, right? Which means that it may not be available for a certain amount of time, uh, which probably is okay for a lot of applications. Eventual consistency, again, probably okay for a lot of applications, okay? So, so from an application perspective, you know, I need to make this, this kind of decision as to which one I want to use, okay? Uh, can I live with consistent, you know, can I live with eventual consistency or can I live with the application not being available for a certain amount of time, okay? So here's an ecosystem, but the ecosystem is generally based on SQL, okay? Uh, and again, we are thinking mainly from the data tier, you know, scaling the web tier, scaling the other tiers are, are relatively straightforward. Scaling the data tier is a hard problem, okay? So if I have my data as relational, okay, then there are a number of SQL approaches like, you know, like scale-based, parallelistic. There are a number of other companies, you know, which are essentially doing this, okay? There is a new SQL approach, okay? There is new SQL, which is not quite SQL. It is SQL, it supports SQL, but, you know, it's not the traditional SQL. And one of the examples there is NeoDB, okay? And there is a chart coming up, okay? Just, just hold on because, you know, it's, it's pretty uh, dense, okay? Then there is, of course, the NoSQL approach, okay? NoSQL approach is like, you know, MongoDB, um, CouchDB, um, Cassandra, and so on and so forth, okay? So those are the examples there. Uh, and then, of course, there is Hadoop-based approach, which is kind of, you know, based on Hadoop, okay? And based on MapReduce, based on HDFS, and so on. There is HBase. Um, what else can I think of? There are a bunch of, bunch of those in that category. But since I don't want to think about this, my friends at 451 Research, okay, came up with this chart. You know, it's a very interesting chart if you have the time, okay. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially, it's kind of done like the London tube map, okay. So, so if, you, if you see, there are a number of different areas. Here's kind of the grid and cache zone. Here's kind of the relational zone. There is the non-relational zone, okay. And there are some which kind of go towards, you know, solar and so on and so forth, okay. But what is the bottom line here? The bottom line here is that there are just way too many choices, okay? As an application developer, you know, I'm sure you'll recognize, you know, uh, something like, for example, um, you know, if I'm looking at, you know, whatever Metascale is, 
okay? Or if I want to look at Oracle's uh, NoSQL solution, it's somewhere out there, okay? MongoDB, somewhere here, right? Because it's in, you know, in one of those zones. Um, as an application developer, you know, it becomes really, really hard, you know, to pick what you want to do. Um, I, I was involved in a, in a project very recently, and really, you know, you can't look at all of this. What we did was we kind of, you know, settled with a chart which looks something like this. So essentially we said, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each of these different technologies, okay? These are just hard requirements, okay? The number of other software requirements, like, you know, do I like the company? Do I like their support? Are they 24 by 7 and all that, okay? But, you know, in this particular case, if you look at, like, for example, Hadoop and HDFS, data locality is one of the big advantages, right? It has a very rich ecosystem, right? But the problem is it's kind of batch-oriented. You know, some of the newer initiatives for real time are not really fully baked yet, okay? It's still happening as we speak. So those are the kind of things we have to live with, right? Uh, Cassandra and HBase, you know, it works really well with HDFS. There is really no data movement required at all, right? Um, I don't know if any of you use DataStack Enterprise Edition. Um, you know, essentially what it does is, you know, it, it, it takes the same Hadoop data and, and you can repurpose that as a Cassandra node or a ring node and, and you know, it uses HDFS to access the data. So it makes it very um, easy. But again, the problem with, you know, any kind of NoSQL approach is that there is no concept of a join. Okay, so your data is not normalized, right? Which means, you know, it, the onus is on the developer, you know, to kind of keep the data consistent, right? So you lose your asset properties, you know. So if your asset is important, you're in trouble, right? So, so the point is, again, you know, as an application developer, there are a lot of things that you really want to be able to, um, to deal with. And my take on this is that there is really no silver bullet, right? Um, most often, they involve multiple technologies, like for example, one of the um, you know, solutions that Rackspace uses, uh, you know, essentially to, to look at the public data, you know, how is your response time, you know, um, how long did it take, uh, you know, all this is processed and we have an analytic, analytic compute grid. Uh, there what we do is we use a number of different technologies, including Mongo, Cassandra, Hadoop, and so on. And I think that's kind of how the, the uh, enterprise is evolving as well. Uh, I put this up just to illustrate, you know, this is again something that I've seen in one of, the, uh, one of our customers. And essentially what they do is they, they do their Hadoop processing, you know, during the low time or the lull time, okay? And essentially what they do is they repurpose the Cassandra nodes as Hadoop nodes, okay? So, you know, you have your task tracker and your job trackers in Hadoop. So now they're, you know, you, you have a limited number of Cassandra nodes, okay, probably only about two. The remaining 10 are now used for Hadoop, okay? So this is what I mean by kind of amorphous clouds. They're not really Cassandra nodes, but they're kind of evolving into, you know, what problem I'm trying to solve at the moment, okay? And then kind of evolving back and kind of shifting and, you know, and morphing and so on. And, and this reality, uh, I mean, this is still, you know, not completely reality right now. Uh, I mean, it's not easy to do it. There are, you know, you have to do it with homegrown tools, but there are tools that are evolving to make this happen. And that is where kind of OpenStack comes in, okay? So what OpenStack does is basically, you know, it's, it's an infrastructure, um, you know, for, for compute, for network, and for storage, okay? As simple as that. Okay, it's a virtualized infrastructure, and we'll see, uh, this was, this is definitely not up to date. Okay, if you go to the OpenStack booth, you'll find the latest, you know, how many number of companies are participating, how many members are there, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so just add yourself if you're not an OpenStack member yet. Okay, but essentially, like I said, what OpenStack is, is a virtualized infrastructure for your compute, for your networking and storage. Okay, one of the things that, you know, kind of, it should have occurred to me earlier, but kind of, you know, as I was preparing for the talk, was that, you know, I, I thought about OpenStack and I said, hmm, actually OpenStack is itself a good example for how you want to build a distributed application, okay? Uh, in fact, you know, if the tenets of OpenStack are pretty, pretty uh, well uh, enunciated, okay? 
And these are the OpenStack design tenets. You know, I'm not going to read through all of this, but this I stole, you know, from the OpenStack, you know, website as is. Okay, and and actually, if you look at how these you know components are designed, um, you know, these goals are really held to the very, you know, um, uh, high order. Okay, scalability, scalability, and elasticity. Sorry, are our main goals, right? Any feature that is not a main goal is a non-goal, okay? So, so you got to be able to kind of have the discipline. Everything should be as asynchronous, okay? If it's not asynchronous, then it's a non-goal, okay? Um, all required components must be horizontally scalable, okay? Needless to say, right? You want to have a shared nothing architecture. You know, I talked about MapReduce. MapReduce is great when you're doing, you know, processing where those different tasks, you know, don't have any dependency on each other. If they have any dependency, you know, they don't quite work well because, you know, you have to then sequence them and so on and so forth, okay? So if you have a shared nothing architecture, you know, it's good for distributed systems, right? Distributed, you know, just about everything. You know, distribute the heck out of everything, right? Uh, and, and again, accept eventual consistency and so on and so forth, okay? So the idea is that data, store, uh, data centers are being virtualized, right? The idea behind OpenStack is just virtualize just about everything, right? Um, you know, in fact, uh, network is virtualized, storage is virtualized, uh, and so on, okay? And, and, and we'll talk about what are all these different components in just a second, okay? But really, the way I look at it is, you know, I come from the Java side, and most of you probably come from the Linux side, right? OpenStack is really the Java EE for the cloud, okay? And think for a moment what this means, right? It's very easy for you to move from one cloud to another cloud, you know, if they're all based on OpenStack. And that's really the fundamental value proposition of OpenStack, okay? If you don't like Rackspace private cloud, you know, no problem, go to the public cloud. If you don't like public cloud, you know, move to HP's cloud or Red Hat cloud or IBM cloud or whatever, right? Uh, and, and that is kind of the same philosophy, you know, in which, uh, which is why Java EE became popular as well. Um, OpenStack session will not be complete if you don't talk about, you know, some of these projects. Okay, Keystone, Horizon, Cinder, Swift, Quantum, Gal Glance, and Nova, okay. Uh, Keystone is for identity management. Horizon is for, you know, is basically a dashboard where you can spin up instances, look at, you know, the general health of your system, okay? Um, Cinder is for block storage. Uh, Swift is object storage. Okay, networking is quantum, okay? But the new name for that is Neutron, okay? Anybody heard of Neutron? Okay, so if you know Neutron, that means um, you're already up, okay? You're already ahead. All right, I've achieved my goal today. Uh, Glance is for image management, and Nova is for computing, okay? It's as simple as that. Um, the bunch of releases that have happened, Austin, Bear, Cactus, Diablo, and so on, and as you can see, a lot of these projects gradually got added, you know, to, um, you know, these different releases. Uh, Havana is going to have, um, you know, Grizzly had Heat. Um, you know, Heat is not mentioned here, right? Uh, it's still an incubated project, but it's going to be integrated or a core project. Um, in, in the next release, which is the Havana project, okay? Most, you, each of these releases are usually released, you know, just before a design summit. Um, and those design summits uh, happen every, every six months, okay? The next design summit actually is happening in November in Hong Kong, okay? And, uh, and the release that's going to precede it is Havana, you know, which is coming out in October, okay? End of October. So it's all done by community, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great community effort. You know, I'm really encouraged by how, how you know, everybody kind of seemed to work with each other. Uh, you know, does it mean that there are no problems at all? You know, absolutely not. You know, there are some issues, but, but most, of the, most often, you know, the community gets together and, and kind of hashes it out. Uh, and, and the big advantage is it's open and completely eliminates vendor lock-in. Um, and really, the idea is to be able to move between clouds. The architecture is pretty straightforward. You know, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use what are referred to as the Keystone APIs. These are all REST-based APIs. Okay, I'll talk about that in a second. 
And then what I do is I use the Nova API to spin up an instance, okay, to create an instance. And all of the communication happens through RabbitMQ, okay? So it communicates with Cinder, with Quantum. Cinder is your block storage. Quantum is the networking, okay? And, and pretty straightforward, um, um, you know, architecture. So if you want to do, you know, if you want to do something with Cinder, again, you do the same thing. You know, Keystone, get me a token, present the token to Cinder, and, you know, mount a value or do whatever you want with it, right? And so on, okay? Glance, same thing. Get me the new image or, you know, create a new image uh, and so on, okay? They're all RESTful APIs, okay? And, and uh, all APIs support some extensions as well, but, um, you know, to use it is pretty straightforward. All that I do here, in this particular case, I provide rags as my username, and here's my password, right? And I'm going to get back a token, okay? As simple as that. And that token is something that I'm going to use, you know, to create a new uh, flavor or a new server or whatever it is that I want to do here, okay? Um, and uh, that's pretty much it, okay? So what I'm going to do here, you know, I'm going to hope that my demo is going to work, okay? And like I said before, I think OpenStack is a great example of how you want to distribute your application, okay? Or how you want to keep your application uh, distributed. And what I'm doing here in this particular case is I have two controllers as they're referred to, okay? So what the controllers do is they handle all the infrastructure services, okay? Like, for example, RabbitMQ, Horizon, uh, and so on and so forth, okay? And then there are a bunch of compute nodes. In this case, I have three compute nodes, okay? And what they do is they allow, to allow you to spin up instances. That makes sense? Now, the beauty of this is that, you know, I have something called as uh, HA proxy, you know, which basically makes this application highly available, okay? So essentially, I could do this with any application, you know, any user application, if I use the same principle, okay? So what I'll do is I'll show you how this is implemented, and if everything works, um, you will probably appreciate this. If it doesn't work, appreciate it anyway, okay? Um, so here's my, if I look at Nova service list, yeah, let me, let me do that in a second. Thank you. I thought I'd set this all up, but yeah, anyway. Okay, can't see this. Okay, um, for those of you who can't read that, you know, essentially I have a bunch of controllers and I have a bunch of computes, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to my, uh, okay, um, here's my instance, okay, and you'll see here that, you know, I'm using 197, okay, basically this is the IP I'm using, okay, to, to, you know, uh, for Horizon, okay? And if I go back to my controller, okay, I will, let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. Okay. So if I, if I do IP, you can, you can see here that 197, is basically a virtual address, okay, which is pointing to that particular controller, okay? It's basically an address that kind of moves between the two different controllers, you know, depending on which controller is active or not, okay? So if a controller goes dies, then your applications should still work, work just fine, okay? That's, that's the goal, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is, you know, launch an instance, okay, which is pretty straightforward, right? Come on. Okay, so I pick an image, okay, and I'm just going to call it Nola, okay, and call it Tiny, whatever, shouldn't matter, and I'm just going to launch it, okay. So hopefully at some point, what you can see here that I'm, you know, it's basically doing a networking right now, okay, it's showing an instance name, it's spawning, 
Okay, it got an IP address of 10.0.100.2, you know, which is a VM instance that is created on one of the compute nodes. I don't know which compute node it is. I don't really care, right? Uh, so it's active and it's running now, right? Which is fine, right? Now what happens if my controller dies, right? So what I'll do to do that is I will actually shut it down, okay? I will do a shutdown right now. Okay, and, and hopefully what should happen now is the, the IP address, you know, the virtual IP should actually um, transfer over to the other um, node, okay? So what I'll do is I'll go to controller HA2, okay? Come on. And uh, we'll see if that works, okay? So if you, if you notice the IP address here, you know, 197 was not bound to, you know, this particular node, okay? But if I run the command now, hopefully the, um, the virtual IP should have transferred over, okay? So do you see here, it's 197, okay? So essentially, it moved from one node to the other. So if I go back to launch my instance, you know, it should be as if, you know, that system never failed, right? It might work in a degraded mode, you know, because I'm not load balancing and all that, okay? But it's still working fine, right? So let me go back and see if I can launch that instance again. Okay, so I'm launching that instance. Okay, and really, you know, this is where I, I kind of hope that it'll work. Okay, so if I go back here, you know, it should still be there, yeah. And at some point it should come up and be able to launch, okay? So, you know, I can still launch it. This is NOLA 2 after failure. After fail is good enough. Okay. Come on. Okay, so it's it's gonna work in a potentially degraded mode, but it'll it'll you know eventually spin up. Okay. So if I go back to my controller HA2, right, and I just do a Nova service list. Okay, so which will list all the services. I should be able to see that those two are down, okay? You'll see that some of those services are down. Okay, you'll see, you know, do you see some of them being down? You know, whichever is on one is down, okay? And hopefully it finished launching, okay? So it, it aired out, but that's fine, okay? Uh, it aired out for whatever reason, but but it should, you know, it should have spun it up, and, and it's fine. So does it make sense? You know, um, I think it's a it's a great example, OpenStack itself, you know, of how to distribute an application and, and how to learn from it. So with that, let me talk about JClouds, and I'm pretty much done. Okay, your OpenStack comes in different, different, different flavors, okay? It could be a private cloud, it could be a public cloud, it could be HP, it could be Red Hat, it could be IBM, it could be Rackspace, it could be anything, right? Uh, to be able to use a common API just across OpenStack, you know, is not easy, okay? And what we do at Rackspace is, you know, JClouds is just one example of what we support. You know, we have AppFog for Ruby developers, Pyrax for Python developers, and so on. But the idea behind all of this is to be able to use a same API to access different flavors of OpenStack, okay? And there are different ways you can do that. There are community portable APIs, there are ecosystem APIs and provider APIs. Um, and what they do is they, they work for, for the ecosystem, they work for the provider and so on. Um, so like for example, if I have a, um, a um, cloud, cloud files, you know, which is really a rack space public cloud implementation based on top of OpenStack, then you use the provider API, okay, and, and, uh, and so on, okay. So you can use this for compute um, or for storage. Okay, on Rackspace cloud servers, on uh, HP, and Amazon as well, you know, if you prefer to use it. Okay, just about, a, you know, a bunch of these different, um, you know, clouds. We have a bunch of different communities um, using this. You know, you might recognize Jenkins, you know, they use this for, um, you know, essentially um, deploying services. You know, Rackspace, of course, we use it. Cloudbees, you know, Jenkins, they use it as well, Red Hat. 
you know, a whole bunch of companies are using this. It's um, a Apache incubating project, and what it does is it essentially takes care of plumbing, reauthentication, pagination, and so on and so forth. Okay, a number of those different features that you really don't have to worry about. Okay, it is open source. It is community based. Um, it is all packaged. There are a number of you know examples and documentation you know that you can take a look at. So in Conclusion, it's really a multi-cloud world, it's really a multi-technology world, right? And you want to be able to deal with it as an application developer. Um, I think OpenStack is great. You know, there are some examples of multiple clouds and multiple everything, okay? The idea is not to drill into this architecture, but the idea is to be able to use this concept of what I refer to as amorphous clouds, you know, where clouds can change shape. You know, after all, a cloud, right? You know, you want it to be able to change shape quickly um, and to be able to deal with these different technologies. Okay, um, some exam I mean some resources. OpenStack, developer.rackspace.com. You know that's a great place to get started. Okay. So the application landscape is changing. Okay, and the idea is to be able to leverage regular commodity servers, but as an application developer, you know I have to do something different as well. It's really a hybrid cloud, right? It's really about multiple technologies. Um, I think OpenStack is wonderful for, you know, for having these amorphous clouds, you know, having these different deployments, having a Cassandra deployment today, a Hadoop deployment tomorrow, and a Couchbase, you know, day after, whatever, Mongo. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, OpenStack, in general, has a very rich ecosystem. You know, things are evolving. I'm not going to say that, you know, we have conquered the developer's, you know, mind, you know, with OpenStack. I, I, I think we are far, far from it. Uh, hopefully, you know, all of you can help in, in making this happen, okay? With that said, I think I probably have time for a couple of uh, questions. Um, you know, I have a few business cards here, you know, if anybody wants to uh, look at how you can use Rackspace Private Cloud, you know, which is really what I get paid for, okay? Feel free to <laughs> get, take a few business cards. Um, but, uh, you know, other than that, you know, I really want to thank you all for coming. Um, you know, hope you have a great conference and enjoy the rest of the time. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm willing to take it now. Thank you again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, um, so let me repeat your question and see if I understood that right. So your question was, uh, you know, yeah, that's fine, you know, the, the node, you know, the IP address moved, but how can I handle it in a way that, you know, it's, it's dedicated for that particular application, right? You know, something along those lines, correct? In this particular case, you know, this node is actually dedicated for that, you know, for that uh, um, data center, if you will, right? So in, in, this, in this particular data center, I have two controller nodes, and that's typically what we recommend, and a lot of you know, other OpenStack um, vendors also recommend the same thing. So we recommend like two controller nodes, which you know, essentially implement the scale out and a bunch of compute nodes, okay? You can have more than one controller node, I mean more than two controller nodes, you know, depending on how big your, your, um, you know, your instance is, right? Uh, you know, typically for up to about 100 nodes, you know, you're fine with about two to uh, you know, two controller nodes and the remaining compute nodes, okay? Um, and essentially, what you do is in your environment, you specify, you know, what are all the different uh, services that are going to be on that particular virtual IP, okay? And that's kind of how you go. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you. Did you guys have any questions for Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so, so how, do I, how do I exactly do that is, you know, yeah, I, I can show you that. Um, yeah, we can, we can take it up later, but uh, let me show you really quickly for those of you who are... Yeah, I think I just did this. So actually, you can see here, 
basically I'm listing the knife environment, okay? And you'll see here that, you know, the glands, glands registry and all that are, are um, configured for 192, 168, 210, 197, okay? So that was the IP that I used, okay? So essentially using the knife scripts, you know, I, I kind of say, okay, this is going to be 197. So, so controller HA1, the two controllers are going to be, you know, if this goes down, the other one is going to be, you know, grabbing that and so on, okay? So it's all done using knife scripts. I don't know if that, again, answered your question, but let's move on to the next one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yes, yeah, we, 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 how do I put this? You know, I mean, I, I don't think there is anything which, you know, is OpenStack sanctioned, but there are a number of third party. Um, one of the things, actually, Gazang, I don't know if you heard of them, they are actually doing a talk in this conference. I recommend you go to that talk because we use them in conjunction with another solution that actually we provided for a health uh, IT provider, okay? So, right. Sure, um, no, nothing, nothing built in yet, but, but uh, there are a number of other providers that work with OpenStack. Or, or does anybody have anything to add? Or, you know, I may not be aware of everything, so feel free to jump in if it's, you had, you had a comment or? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think what he's talking about is data which is uh, not in flight, but data which is resident on the disk, right? Both, both. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.